Petrograd Soviet immediately demanded to sort of communicate with the members of the Duma. The Duma had by this time been in suspension, but the members of the Duma had continued to assemble and discuss problems pressing upon the Russian state and they were extremely dissatisfied with the manner in which the Tsarist autocracy was moving. So when the Petrograd Soviet communicated with the representatives of the Duma demanding the abdication of the Tsar and takeover of all public authority by the, by the members of the Duma, it struck a very sympathetic chord. And the members of the Duma for, for put forward the same kind of demand for the abdication of the Russian Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, and the, the request was followed by an uh, insistence that such abdication should be immediate. Now the Tsar was definitely not willing to go that gracefully. So the Tsar considered deploying troops inside the capital of Petrograd in order to break the demonstrations of the working classes and hammer into submission the political representatives of the Russian people, um, basically the members of the Duma. The chief of the army staff, General Alexeyev, however, was in a quandary. If troops were to be sent to Petrograd, they, have to be sent, they had to be sent from the battlefront because there are four or five regiments associated with the Petrograd uh, city, such as the Ryabushinsky regiment. They were all involved with the workers Soviet that had come up. So the troops had to be transported from the battle front, battlefield in the Western Front. Now there were two problems associated with this. If troops were to be deployed away from the Western Front, then it would mean that the front line would collapse against German advance. And in order to to suppress domestic disturbance, Russia was or would be on the verge of losing the war. There was a second problem also. Troops, if they had to be brought into Petrograd, could be brought into Petrograd only by means of the railways. But the railroad network was dominated entirely by the members of the workers Soviets and no hard artillery, no heavy artillery could actually be brought into the city. As a consequence, General Alexeyev was not forthcoming with any assurance for the Tsar. As a result, once the pressure began to mount, after a time Alexeyev himself requested the Tsar to step down for the sake of the country. Tsar Nicholas II accordingly resigned on 15th of February and he proposed that he be succeeded by his relative Mikhail Romanov as the uh, regent. But the appointment of Mikhail Romanov was unacceptable to the Petrograd Soviet and they rejected it out of hand. The members of the, the provisional, uh, members of the Duma at this stage stood forth and agreed with the Petrograd Soviet and decided to take up the reins of government in their own hand. And this is the stage at which the members of the Duma, the elected members of the, du of the Duma that had been suspended, now came to constitute the provisional government. The provisional government, led in the main by people from across the political spectrum that had been uh, developing over the 19th century, such as people from the cadets, the constitutional democrats, the uh, octoberists and the social revolutionaries. They came forth in order to push for a steady um, disengagement with the war if possible, but definitely with a steadying of the domestic situation. The problem however was that at this stage the provisional government dared not open any negotiation for peace because one, uh, until the turmoil at home was resolved, it could not uh, sue for peace because it would be considered as a sign of weakness. Moreover, Germany and Austria-Hungary, the belligerents with whom Russia was fighting in the Great War, were representatives of conservative monarchical forces.
and the provisional government was aspiring towards a liberal and a democratic credential. So they decided to continue the war, no longer a war fought for imperialist aims, but for aims of promoting liberalism and democracy. Although the real reason was definitely the fact that any negotiation with the Germans at that stage would be considered as a sign of weakness. So the provisional government continued with the war and the battle in the front, but at home it was trying to steady this to soothe the nerves as it were. In the city of Petrograd, however, the constitutional democrats, the Octoberists, all these forces of the provisional government did not really have much support on the ground. The support on the ground remained with the Petrograd Soviet who had brought about by uh, who had brought about the abdication of the Tsar. Between February and March, in Russia we see the emergence of two different centers of authority. One was the provisional government with which all the institutions of the Tsarist autocracy gradually began to affiliate themselves. So the elected Zemstvas of the provincial and the local regions began to be associated with the provisional government. On the other hand emerged the revolutionary forces of the Soviets generally made up of councils of workers in the industrial regions and also soldiers councils in the different garrison towns. The force that says affiliated with the Petrograd Soviet however were generally unrepresented meaning these people were not elected. They were here only with a revolutionary agenda for total and dramatic and social change. This is where the forces that had previously been associated with the social democratic party such as the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks and those that had been associated with the Narodniki movement which were by this time the social revolutionaries of the left and of the right, the left SR and the right SR. They were coming together with a revolutionary agenda for change. The provincial government was led by people such as uh, Lvov and Milyukov. The Petrograd Soviet was led by the working class deputies such as Shlyapnikov, by Mensheviks such as Kaidza, the, by the social revolutionaries such as Soren, and most important of all, the deputy of the Labour Party, the Trudoviki Party, a man called Kerensky. Kerensky was becoming very quickly by March to June, between March to June 1917, he was emerging as the bridge between the Petrograd Soviet and the provisional government. In, the, in this period of turmoil, the Petrograd Soviet began to push for, uh, for revolutionary changes and the reason why they managed to make their argument stick was because they were in charge effectively of the administration of the capital Petrograd. Elsewhere the Soviets were merely uh, in uh, rudimentary, they were in an embryonic stage for instance in places like Moscow. Whereas the provisional government which had the, which had the support of the entire administrative apparatus of the Tsarist autocracy without any affiliation to the monarchical forces themselves managed to hold on this sort of study, um, hold on to the task of stabilizing uh, the nation as it were. However, the continuation of the war meant that the crisis that had brought about the February revolution in the first place persisted. And while the military was for the time being opting to work on behalf of the provisional government, there was no endearment, there was no loyalty, the loyalty of the military towards the provisional government was not going to be taken for granted. In such a situation the provisional government needed to mobilize the masses behind it. And this is a, this is a role that Kerensky was to play uh, significantly because Kerensky being the labor bridge, the bridge with the masses of the Russian people was brought into the provisional government upon which Milyukov, the foreign minister resigned and left. He was leader of the cadets. Once Kerensky comes on board, the provisional government decided 
in order to pacify the masses to go for what it called a land reform program. And the whole idea was it would set up a council which would look into the possibility of where land reforms could be made, how could land be redistributed without dislocating the existing framework of property. And this was very understandable because the forces affiliated with the provisional government were also those who had some stake in landed property in the countryside. So once the war could not be stopped, a, a new venue uh, of uh, revolutionary activity had to be sought and this was to be found in the land reforms move. However, the Bolshevik faction of the Social Democratic Party, which was present in the Petrograd Soviet, but not in the provisional government, decided to push for a revolutionary agenda. In fact, the most revolutionary leader of um, the Bolshevik faction was at this point of time actually out of Russia. And he, Vladimir Lenin, came forth with the argument that all power should go to the Soviets and not the provisional government. The provisional government being a continuation of the same social forces that had sustained the autocracy should be immediately dispensed with. And Lenin's popularity grew because Lenin began to argue that the war being an imperialist war should be immediately stopped so that the consequences of imperialist ambitions of the Romanov dynasty do not have to be paid for by the Russian people. As Lenin's popularity grew, the Germans realized that bringing Lenin inside Russia was the best possible way of bringing the war to a precipitated close, a precipitated end. So they managed to smuggle Lenin into a railway carriage into Russia. As Lenin entered Russia, he began to make the demand that all power should ultimately go for the Soviets. And given the period of turmoil, a large number of people began to affiliate themselves with the local Soviets and among them Lenin's power began to grow, Lenin's influence began to grow. The situation was coming to such a pass that by August September 1917, the labor disturbances when they began to take place, the Bolshevik participation in this was becoming a crucial factor. There was however another factor which is seldom spoken of. Around this time, Ju July-August 1917 that is to say, the, the entire economic apparatus finally began to give way. As the turmoil began to grow, as prices began to escalate and as the situation in the front began to deteriorate, the military production, the industrial production for military purposes also began to suffer. And in line with this, a number of factories began to sort of go bust. The individual factory workers began to, uh, began to be concerned about their own livelihood, about, about their own survival and they began to set up what are known as factory committees. When a factory collapsed, the factory committee would then take up the challenge of keeping the unit going. These factory committees began to be a new factor in the mobilization of labor not affiliated with any of the mainstream labor organizations like the Through the Viki or the Bolsheviks or even the Mensheviks. They were concerned only with the continuation of their own individual units and this was opening a kind of fragmentation within the labor front. And as the Bolsheviks tried to discourage the factory committees, opposition began to grow even towards the Bolsheviks in the very areas where they had been fairly powerful till this point of time. So in and around Petrograd, in and around the industrial regions of Nizhny Novgorod, the factory committees began to be a new factor in the equation. So by July, by uh, August 1917, the turmoil was becoming more and more confounded. Once the promise of land reforms was made by the Kerensky government, the turmoil then spread to the countryside because the possibility of owning land was being sort of mooted before the people, the conscripts who had been taken from the countryside and sent to the battlefield, they decided to vote with their feet. Since the possibility of actually claiming a land was greater if one was already in ownership of that piece of land, a large number of peasants 
people who were originally peasants who had been mobilized during the war suddenly deserted from the front and dashed back to the countryside in order to claim some land for themselves. Understandably, given the growing dislocation, the forces of landed uh, ownership in the countryside, landlords or um, even small land owning peasants, they began to be very alarmed at the prospect of a total breakdown of order in the countryside. And these forces then stood forth as pockets of resistance towards the provisional government as well as the Petrograd Soviet. The, the, in the countryside therefore, uh, as, as estate offices were being looted and peasants were being cracked down upon by forces uh, affiliated with the landlords of the countryside, the entire Russian Empire seemed to be on the verge of total disintegration. It was in this background that the claim that Lenin made that the war had to be brought to a precipitate end in order for Russia to survive began to grow much greater significance. And the support for Lenin also began to grow within the Petrograd Soviet. There was a very, for a very long time that Lenin was considered to be marginal by the left SRs and the right SRs. Even the interregionals led by former Bolshevik and Menshevik faction leader Lev Trotsky now began to come around to Lenin's demand that the war should be brought to an immediate end. By October 1917, it was becoming extremely clear for all concerned that the forces of reaction in the countryside, those who were opposed to land reforms, were now about to team up with the slow segments of the Russian military who were determined to oppose the revolutionary forces. So, by October 1917, it was becoming very clear that the forces of counter-revolution were about to dislodge the provisional government and take over power. In a period of such a crisis, Lenin came forth with his famous argument, who whom, who replaces whom. The Bolsheviks led by Lenin began to make the case that since the forces of counter-revolution were taking up arms, they had to be responded to with arms, a military insurgency was in order. A military revolutionary committee was set up under the leadership of Leon Trotsky with association of people like uh, Stalin helping him in developing what was to become later the colonel of the Red Army. The Bolsheviks were planning towards an insurgency, a coup, and they wanted it to be endorsed by the forthcoming All-Russia Congress of Soviets in October 1917. At the All-Russia Congress of Soviets, the Bolsheviks came forth with their declaration that there was to be a change in the policy of the Petrograd Soviet. It would no longer work with the provisional government because it was not effective. And the Petrograd Soviet was urging all the other Soviets who were represented in the ARCS, the All Russia Congress of Soviets, that they should help the Petrograd uh, Soviet in rising up in arms. There was a major difference of opinion even within the ARCS the right SR and the Mensheviks uh, walked out. The left SRs supported the Bolsheviks in this uh, demand for insurgency. But when the ARCS failed to come up with a conclusive opinion on this point, the Bolsheviks declared that they were going ahead with the coup anyway. The coup was launched, as we know, on the momentous night of the 24th and 25th of October by the old calendar, 8th and November, 9th November by the new calendar. And this was followed by an immediate raid on the various ministries, ministers were either driven out or arrested. And Kerensky, the leader of the provisional government from the month of July, August, had to flee. With this ended the course of, course of developments associated with the February Revolution and began the October Revolution of 1917.